Today's webinar is on preventing pest problems at seeding. The webinar will be presented by Lauren Fordyce and Tracy Celio. Lauren is the Urban Community IPM Educator for the UC Statewide IPM Program. She holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and has several years of experience in both agriculture and horticulture. Tracy oversees the Master Gardener Program in El Dorado and Amador counties. Lauren, you can go ahead and share your slides and start the presentation. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Fordyce, and today we're going to be talking all about pest problems at seeding or pests that might affect your seedlings. So if you haven't already, I'm sure many of you are preparing to start seeds either indoors or outside in the garden. And starting seeds yourself rather than just buying transplant seedlings can be a cost-effective and rewarding process. And it often allows us to grow things that you might not be able to find in the grocery store or at the garden center. So starting seeds, however, can prove to be a little bit more difficult than maybe we might have originally thought. Um, I know I've definitely experienced that. So this presentation will hopefully help you identify any pests that you might encounter along the way, but also understand how, that you, how you can prevent them from becoming problems in the first place. Um, we're going to discuss what IPM is and why using an IPM approach can be helpful in all kinds of situations. And then we'll talk about identification of several common seedling pests and how we can prevent and control them. And then again, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna hand it over to Tracy, who's gonna cover the basics of seed starting and also talk about some of the great resources offered by the UC Master Gardeners. So if you're unfamiliar with IPM, it is a way that we can prevent um, pest problems, integrated pest management, and it's a great place to start for all kinds of pest problems. It's a more sustainable and environmentally friendly way to manage pests, not just in the garden, but in the home and landscape as well. And if you're wondering what exactly is a pest, it can be anything that is bothering, or bothering you or annoying you. And this includes things that might harm your plants like deer, damage your structures such as termites, or that presents maybe a health risk to you or the environment such as mosquitoes. And IPM relies on methods that pose minimal risk to people and the environment. This includes the use of biological control, which is the use of things um, like ladybugs as natural enemies. So these um, go out and help us in the environment to control unwanted pests by parasitizing them or feeding on them. We also use cultural controls, which include altering the environment to make it less suitable for pests, but more favorable for the desired plants. And this often has a lot to do with the care that we provide. Um, physical controls include directly killing or blocking out pests. And this is things like fences and traps. So in IPM, we really focus on pest prevention rather than taking a more reactive approach to pest problems like spraying pesticides. So taking this more precautionary approach often means that pest problems are minimal easier to control and our need for pesticides is reduced and sometimes even eliminated. Um, however, it's important to note that pesticides are still an important part and certainly can be helpful in certain situations. So when we do have to use pesticides in IPM, we are using less toxic products that are safer for us and also the environment so that we can help pose fewer risks to those natural enemies that are helping us with biological control and also protect water quality and other things. So in this presentation, we'll be focusing on how biological, cultural, and physical controls can help us prevent pests at the time of seeding or um, once we put them in the garden. So whether you're starting your seeds indoors, maybe on your dining room table, maybe on a windowsill, in a dedicated greenhouse space, or outside directly into garden beds or pots, there are many pests that you probably are going to encounter affecting your seedlings. Um, seedlings and young plants in general are very susceptible to pests for a couple of reasons. 
One of them being seedlings have softer leaves than more mature plants. And so insects, especially young insects with maybe weaker mouth parts, prefer to feed on these softer plants than some kind of mature plant with tougher leaves. And this is often why you'll hear that certain pests will favor new growth of plants. Um, in addition, young plants just have not quite established the tolerances that older, more established plants have. A couple aphids on your, you know, couple month old plant is usually okay and it can tolerate that, but on a new seedling, it's gonna cause a lot of damage because it's, it's a smaller plant um, and also just does not have that tolerance built up, does not quite have the established root system and all of that. So it's very important that we protect our young seedlings from pests because they are very vulnerable at this stage. So what are some seedling pests? They can be, invertebrates like insects, fungus gnats, and aphids. They can be mollusks, which includes snails and slugs. They could be disease-causing pathogens like pythium that causes damping off. And they can also be vertebrate pests like animals such as mice, squirrels, and deer. However, sometimes our pest problem might not be a result of any of these. And unfortunately, we might be the, the culprits in some situations. So, you know, despite our best efforts, things happen and seeing starting can be a little bit difficult. So again, we'll touch on some of those care um, requirements later on in the presentation. So in the next few slides, we'll discuss what some of these seedling pests are and describe their damage to help you identify them. So fungus gnats. They are a very common pest of seedlings and potted plants, both indoors and outside. If you've been growing plants for any amount of time, you've likely encountered them. Um, they're very small, resembling fruit flies or very tiny mosquitoes. They have very long legs. Um, you can see them flying around your seedlings or pots. They kind of look like when you've got a fruit fly infestation, kind of just annoying and flying around. You can sometimes see them crawling on the surface of the soil. Um, and much like our seedlings need moist um, soil and a moist environment to grow and germinate, fungus gnats need that moist soil um, to survive and lay their eggs. So this is why um, reducing moisture can be really important in their prevention and control. The larvae of fungus gnats live in the soil and they feed on your plant's roots. And this is obviously detrimental to young seedlings that are just starting to develop their root system. Um, so this feeding can cause stunted growth, wilting, and if you've got a really bad infestation, it can kill your seedlings entirely. So because fungus gnats lay their eggs in the top couple inches of moist soil, we want to try to avoid heavy watering that leaves the soil saturated. Once the seeds have germinated, um, try to allow the soil to dry a bit between watering, and you might also consider watering from the bottom. You can use plant saucers like in that top photo, or if you're using um, plastic flats or seed cell trays, you can use a flat bottom tray there to water from the bottom instead. Um, placing sticky trap cards in your greenhouse or wherever you're starting seeds can also be a great way to control and catch adult fungus gnats, but also keep an eye on the situation. Um, if you start to notice more and more fungus gnats showing up on these sticky cards, um, it's a good indicator that you really need to adjust some of your practices. Uh, and these, these sticky traps are available in all kinds of shapes and sizes. As you can see, you can get them to be butterflies. You can just get plain old rectangles. Um, but those are very easy to come by and a great way to monitor. Um, pesticides are not very effective for fungus net control as the timing of the application really needs to be timed with when the larvae are actually in the soil feeding. Um, so this oftentimes means very frequent applications of pesticides. Um, however, you might choose to use one of these products. Um, most of the products out there to control fungus gnats are a BT or Bacillus thuringiensis product. Um, and you wanna be sure that when you are going to use one of these products, you make sure that it is meant for fungus gnats. There are other BT products out there that are meant for caterpillars. And if you use the wrong one, they won't work on each other. So 
Israelensis is the one that will work on the larval stage of fungus gnats and mosquitoes. So keep that in mind. And if you do decide to use pesticides, please be sure to read the label, make sure you can use it inside. And if not, take that plant outside to do that. Wireworms, these are likely um, only a problem if you're growing directly into a garden bed outside um, because they take several years to complete their life cycle in the soil. So they are the larvae of flick beetles. They kind of resemble mealworms and they thrive in areas with um, lots of organic matter and damp soils. They also feed on the roots of young plants including the above ground stem and plant material and they can even sometimes burrow into the stems which can directly kill your seedlings. Um, but for the same reason, fungus gnats feeding on your plant roots is not great. Wireworms feeding on your young seedlings roots is also not ideal. So what you can do to prevent or kind of help control and minimize the impact that wireworms have is rotating your above ground and below ground crops. So carrots and other vegetables or plants that fruit below ground are preferred by these insects. They live in the soil and having carrots and potatoes and whatnot growing right underneath in the soil is easy access for them. So we can minimize their populations by alternating above ground and below ground crops. So planting something like tomatoes and peppers in an area where maybe you had beets and carrots last year. Um, tillage can also work to bring them up to the soil surface where they might be exposed to some predators like birds. Aphids are another very common pest on all kinds of plants. There are a variety of species and therefore colors, and they can often be quite difficult to see as they hide on the undersides of leaves and along stems. Um, we call aphids honeydew producers because they feed on the sugary sweet plant sap. Um, and as a result, they excrete this sticky substance called honeydew that kind of makes a mess of your plants and promotes the growth of sooty mold. Um, so it's not really something we want around. Um, and again, because aphids um, feed on the newer growth of plants, um, our seedlings are quite susceptible to them and they can stunt um, plant growth and cause leaves to curl like in that top photo, um, in addition to them just being distorted and kind of having a, a pushback. So aphids can also vector or transmit viruses to plants, uh, which is one extra reason if we were looking for another one to keep them off of our plants. Um, so in severe infestations, they can weaken young plants to the point of death. Um, so it's important to control this early before it really becomes out of control. And they can also just spread throughout your greenhouse or growing environment quite quickly too. So the good news is there are very many natural enemies like ladybugs and parasitic wasps that can help us control aphids. Um, especially ones that are grown outdoors or maybe in a greenhouse, you're unlikely to find these guys coming into your home. Um, but in this top photo, you can see those little brown, um, bronzy balls on the bottom of that leaf. And those are actually aphids that have been parasitized by a tiny parasitic wasp. And we call those aphid mummies. So the parasitic wasp comes along, lays its egg inside of a live aphid, and then the parasitic wasp egg is now growing inside of the aphid, feeding on it from the inside out. Um, pretty cool stuff um, and very much what we want to see in the garden. Um, these guys are doing the dirty work for us. Um, in that bottom photo, you'll see a ladybug larva eyeing up some aphids. So both adult ladybugs and their larva are voracious predators of aphids um, as well as other insects. Uh, so want to keep an eye out for them and try to promote their um, try to promote populations of them in your garden as much as you can. And we can do this um, especially by minimizing the use of pesticides. So for seedlings that are indoors where you're unlikely to have these natural enemies venture, you can simply hand pick or squish them with your hands. Um, take them outside and give them a strong spray of water. Or maybe if you have a kitchen sink with a strong pressure sprayer, you can spray, spray off your plants that way. Um, they're, they're knocked off the plants pretty easily. And uh, most of the time, if we're growing them, if we're growing plants inside, 
there are not that many of them and we can control them ourselves. Um, yeah, and just remember that if we do choose to use pesticides to control them, we are doing that in accordance to the label and taking them outside if the product cannot be used inside. So armyworms and cutworms are both very large caterpillars that are the larvae of moths. They're about an inch to an inch and a half long and they emerge from the soil. So these are again, generally only a problem if you're starting seeds directly outside in a garden bed. So armyworms damage seedlings by feeding on their crown or the top part of the plant and cutworms get their name because they cut down young seedlings at the soil level. You can see a photo of this in that bottom picture where that's kind of curled around the base of the plant. Um, and yeah, they will also feed on plant roots. So because cutworms tend to feed in the evening hour and hide in weeds during the day, we wanna check for them at night and remove any weeds or debris that are around your garden. This is usually a great harborage place for many pests, so it's important to try to clear up those areas um, regardless. So since they are larger caterpillars, they are pretty easy to hand pick off of plants um, and you can protect your plants from them by using some kind of protective cloth or row cover to keep them from coming onto your plants. Alternatively, some people will place aluminum or cardboard collars, something like a toilet paper roll around the base of the plant to keep the caterpillar from having access to the stem. White grubs are the larvae of several species of scarab beetles. You've likely encountered these at some point digging around in the dirt. They feed in the soil, primarily on the roots of grasses. So you're usually unlikely to find them in your garden beds. Um, however, if you have a garden bed that is near a grassy area, or you recently converted part of your lawn or another grassy area into a garden bed, um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for them to just be there by chance and feed on your seedling roots just because they're already there. Um, so white grubs are a tasty snack for many animals. And so what this means is that birds, skunks, and other animals might come digging in your garden for them. And that's usually a good indicator that you um, might have them and it might be a problem. So to check for grubs, you can dig around in the soil. About six inches deep is about as far as you need to go. Hand pick whichever ones you see. They're again, large enough to do that. Um, you can feed them to your backyard chickens if you have those. You can leave them out for the birds or you can test taste them yourself. White grubs are actually um, eaten in many parts of the world, so you could give that a try. Um, tilling the soil also works to bring them up to the soil for those predators um, to come after and get them. Flea beetles are very tiny black, brown, or striped beetles. Um, they have a habit of jumping when disturbed, um, and they will cause damage to the leaves by creating these shot holes, this characteristic pitting of the leaf surface, and they can um, cause some serious damage to young seedlings. Um, but mature plants, uh, as we mentioned, can usually handle uh, the little bit of cosmetic damage that they cause. And for flea beetles, they overwinter in weeds and vegetative debris. So again, removing that from around the garden is very important. Uh, we can also use row cover, a protective cloth or covering uh, to keep them off of our plants too. And sticky traps will also work to catch these guys because um, they will jump or fly out of the plant. Garden symphalians, also known as garden centipedes, are small white arthropods, not actually insects, and they live for many years in the soil. They feed on the roots of plants, causing stunted growth and sometimes killing seedlings entirely before they even have a chance to emerge from the soil. So their control is very difficult, but there are several soil dwelling organisms like ground beetles and other true centipedes that are known to feed on them. Uh, tillage can also be a way to control these pests. Earwigs are easily recognized by the prominent little pinchers that they have at the end of their body. 
they lay their eggs in the soil and they then overwinter there. So these are again, usually only an issue if you have um, seedlings that you're putting or seeds or seedlings that you're putting directly into your garden beds outside. Um, and during the day, earwigs hide in dark, cool, moist places. And this could include weeds again, but also loose soil or under rocks and that kind of stuff. So at night, they feed on both dead and living things. Uh, so this is a great time to go check for them. But um, also worth mentioning is that they do feed on aphids and insect eggs. Um, so they can be both beneficial, but also harmful. So damaged seedlings from earwig feeding may be missing all or parts of their leaves, and the stems on older seedlings can have numerous irregular chewed holes around the edges. This kind of resembles caterpillar damage. Um, so to distinguish earwig damage from caterpillar damage, we can look for caterpillar frass or caterpillar poop um, or webbing to determine if the damage was caused by them or not. You can also, like I said, go out and check your plants at night and see if you have earwigs on them. Um, and if you do find earwigs, you can usually pluck them off, put them into a bucket of soapy water, um, something like that. So earwigs like shady, moist environments, like we said, so trying to reduce those hiding spots for them during the day can also be very important. Pesticides are not very effective at controlling earwigs, but instead, Traps are a great way to catch them um, and kill them in the garden. So you can do this by filling a shallow container, something like a tuna or cat food can with about half an inch of oil with um, a drop of bacon grease in it. And you wanna bury those in the soil so they're about at soil level and then the earwigs will just fall in there and then they can't get out. Um, you can also do a similar thing using rolled up newspaper or cardboard, placing it out in the soil and this is now a nice cool shady place for them to go hide during the day. And so you can go out in the morning and find plenty of them uh, hanging out inside of that curled up newspaper. So again, just dumping them in a bucket of soapy water or maybe putting them in a bag and um, crushing them. Snails and slugs enjoy the tender new growth of seedlings as well. They chew holes in their leaves and can sometimes eat seedlings all the way down to the ground, so you're left with just a little nub. Uh, they thrive in moist, cool environments as well and are again, just like earwigs, mostly active when the sun goes down or on cloudy, rainy days like we've been having. So to um, control and prevent snails and slugs in your garden, you again want to reduce excess moisture and places for them to hide like weeds and under logs and those kinds of things. You can go out and handpick them at night. You can also set similar traps, uh, a beer trap, including a shallow dish filled a little bit with beer placed at soil level and they'll fall in there and can't get out. Uh, you can also use a wooden board uh, placed on the soil on about an inch off the ground. And because this is a nice shady cool spot, they will go hang out underneath of there and you can go out and lift up the board like in that top photo and see lots of snails and slugs underneath of there. So you can just pick them off and dispose of them however you like. Um, something to keep in mind is a lot of the poison bait pesticides that are available for snails and slugs um, are only effective when they are kept dry. So with the rainy weather that we've been having and also if you're watering your garden frequently, which you should be if you're trying to start seeds in it, um, that's going to make this poison bait pesticide very ineffective um, and even kind of cause environmental harm if we're getting lots of rain and you're constantly putting snail and slug bait out and it's just washing away, uh, not really doing anything. So just keep that in mind as well. So damping off might be the most common way seedlings die both indoors and outside. It is caused by several plant pathogens that thrive in cool, moist environments and compacted soils. So when seeds or seedlings are planted into soil that is a little too cold or a little too moist, you're likely to encounter damping off. And this can also be something that over time, if you are just giving your plants too much water, um, they can develop this as well. 
So seedlings may appear fine one day and the next you come out and they're bent over like uh, that poor plant in the circle on that bottom photo. Um, and it kind of looks like someone pinched them off at the base. And you might also notice lesions on the plant stem. So you can prevent damping off by avoiding getting the soil very wet, misting it a couple times a day rather than saturating it. Um, and you want to also make sure that your soil is warm enough for the seeds that you're growing um, and your seedlings. So you can do this by using a soil thermometer, making sure it's the right temperature, waiting a little bit longer till the weather warms up. Or if you're growing inside, you can use heat mats underneath of your pots or flats that you're growing in. Uh, if you've had damping off issues in the past, you want to make sure that you've properly cleaned and sterilized those pots and whatever else was in contact with those infected plants. Um, damping off can be spread very easily from contaminated pots in the soil, so it's important to sterilize them with something like bleach or alcohol, and you can solarize to, infil to uh, kill infected uh, pathogens in the soil. Rats, mice, voles, chipmunks, squirrels, gophers, all of these guys can damage your seedlings um, outside in the greenhouse and in some cases, probably even inside of your home. So they will feed on seedlings, eating them right down to the stem. And they can also go in and dig up germinating seeds right from your garden. So they can, they can be really frustrating to deal with um, not to mention, they will chew through anything and everything in their way. Uh, so pots and irrigation lines, anything that you've got in their way, they will chew through it to get to your, um, your nice seedlings. So we don't want these guys hanging out in the garden because, again, they can cause a lot of damage, but also because they can carry diseases. So we want to try to keep them out by sealing up cracks and openings larger than a quarter of an inch. You can do this with wood, caulking, or mesh wire. Uh, snap traps are an effective solution both indoors and outside. Um, and for rodents um, and other vertebrate animals like deer, using some kind of fence around your garden can be a good deterrent. Using some kind of finer fence or mesh like um, in this picture, you can get creative with, with how you put that around your garden bed to keep them away, prevent them from coming in and digging in your garden. Um, so dealing with these pests, the rodents and the vertebrate pests can be quite challenging and often requires a little bit of creativity at keeping them out. Um, weeds are usually not so much of a problem if you're starting your seeds indoors. However, if you are starting them outside, um, you're likely to encounter them. Um, so because weeds are not desirable to have around because they compete with nutrients for our desirable plants, in addition to sunlight, water, and um, space, we want to make sure that we're trying to get rid of them as soon as we can. Um, they can also spread insects and other pests to our seedlings, as we've mentioned prior. Um, so we want to try to make sure we remove all of the weeds in and around the garden. Um, however, when it comes to seedlings that are germinating at the same time as weed seeds, we want to be a little bit more cautious here. So it can oftentimes be difficult to distinguish a germinating seed that you planted yourself from something that might be just popping up in your garden. So for this reason, it's best to wait until the seedlings have developed their true leaves. So in this photo here, those top two leaves that are characteristic of this plant which is a bean plant, um, you wanna wait till you see those and not just those first seed leaves or the cotyledons, which are those bottommost leaves. Um, this way you can determine, okay, yeah, that's my bean plant. I wanna keep that or, oh no, that looks like a grass um, and I wanna pull that out. So once we've made sure that what we're going to be pulling is not actually the plants that we planted, we wanna be careful um, when we're removing them from around one another because the weeds, um, their, their roots can be tangled together. And when you go to pull that weed seed out or weed seedling out, you can disrupt the root system of the plant that you're trying to grow. So we wanna be very careful doing that. 
Um, and this also goes for if you overseeded and you need to thin out your planting, you just wanna be careful not to dislodge the existing seedling um, and disturb its root system too much because again, they're very fragile at this stage. So we wanna be very careful. So in general, preventing pest problems relies on cultural control, which again is altering the growing environment, making it more favorable for plant health and less favorable for these pests. So we wanna rely on the following cultural practices to make it um, less likely that pests bother your plants. Um, and in the event that they do, hopefully um, we are giving them the right care that they can kind of tolerate that um, and handle that better. So ensure that you're giving your plants the right growing environment. Ensure they have the right sunlight um, or else you're gonna get leggy, weak plants. Make sure the growing environment is the right temperature or we might see things like damping off. Uh, remember, most seeds require moderately warm soil and soil temperatures to even germinate. Uh, so investing in a soil thermometer could be a good idea, um, but also just referring to planting calendars uh, for your area could be a great idea as well. We wanna make sure that we're using clean potting soil that is free of weed seeds and pathogens, um, in addition to any insects that might be hanging out in them. Another thing that we can do to prevent pest problems is buying resistant or treated seeds. Uh, there are many varieties that are resistant to things like root rots or pythium or nematodes. Um, so you can look for things like that as well if it's been an issue with the, for you in the past. Um, lastly, when your indoor seedlings are ready to be planted outside, you know, they've gotten big enough and we're ready to go put them out in the garden, you wanna make sure that you properly acclimate them to the outdoor environment before going and taking them out there. Um, because if you don't, you're going to risk transplant shock and sunburn and just result in unhealthy plants that are now going to be more susceptible to pests. So to wrap up, here are some tools that we use in IPM to prevent pests from damaging our seedlings or our plants. So sticky traps, great for flying insects like fungus gnats. You can stake them in pots, hang them near your seedlings and find them just about anywhere. Uh, row covers, a great physical control method to keep pests like beetles, aphids, and caterpillars from coming onto or laying eggs onto your seedlings. Um, and th these, these can be really important in giving your plants a good head start by holding off pests until those plants are more established and they can tolerate it a little bit better. Um, so they would be a good investment. Um, just remember that these don't work for some of the soil dwelling pests that live in the soil and overwinter there um, or, or animal pests that are gonna chew right through this, right? Uh, so for those animal pests, we wanna try to use metal fence or mesh around the garden to help deter them um, and maybe some traps. I wanna emphasize that your hands are also a great tool in IPM. Um, it's the greatest way to get um, free and effective uh, control of many pests. So don't be afraid to use them. Uh, biological controls like natural enemies, the ladybugs and parasitic wasps that we talked about are really important in helping us control pests in the garden and we really want to encourage that. So keep that in mind and cultural practices like improving the growing environment again, to be favorable for your seedlings and not the pest is a huge way to prevent pest problems at seeding. And lastly, if none of the physical, biological, or cultural controls seem to be working, we can use um, less toxic pesticides to control these pests, help bring them down to a more tolerable level. So if you want to learn more about IPM and how to manage a variety of pests in the home and garden, you can visit the UCP UC IPM website and also follow us on social media. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy to cover some of the basics of seed starting and also discuss how the UC Master Gardener program can help you with your seed starting adventure. Fantastic. Lauren, thank you. And thank you to the IPM office for inviting me here today. Uh, my goal uh, is really to just give a very condensed 
seed starting basics for um, gardeners and growers. Um, this is um, part of a three hour lecture that the UC Master Gardeners in El Dorado County led by Debbie Hillel and Gail Fulbeck um, offer for El Dorado County. Um, so those slides I'll post in the chat at the end of my presentation. Uh, all of this is pulled from the UC Master Gardener Handbook, um, Chapter 5 on Plant Propagation. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first things first, you gather your supplies. You're going to need appropriate containers for planting your seeds. You're going to need potting soil or soil medium. You need water, labels, um, and any other materials that you use for getting your seeds started. So that might be um, toothpicks, spoons, you know, whatever you use for making holes and putting your seeds um, into the soil. Um, the next thing you need to do is hydrate the soil before adding to containers. This is a mistake that's often made when folks bring home a bag of potting soil from their favorite garden store, um, that they simply put it into the containers. Um, you're going to have um, very dry soil and uh, possibly run into some problems. Um, so hydrate that soil ahead of time. Once the soil consistency is moist, and master gardeners like to say moist like a wrung out sponge, not wet, um, not um, sopping, but um, nice and moist. You can go ahead and add it to your container, not quite to the top. Um, you'll tamp lightly on your pots or your um, seed container, and then you're ready to sow your seeds. Uh, medium to large seeds, you'll need to plant approximately one to two inches apart. You'll sow those uniformly and then cover them with soil and then lightly water. So for tiny seeds, you'll need to broadcast those uniformly across the potting soil medium, lightly press into the soil and mist with a spray bottle. Um, another thing that you need to be careful with um, when starting seeds is um, how you water them. Water can dislodge the seeds from the soil or it can bury them too deeply or it can move seeds around. So um, we really like to use um, uh, a spray bottle and um, moisten those, those seeds. Um, make sure that you label and date your starts. Often we think that we're gonna remember what we planted and then we're not sure if we put zinnias or tomatoes into a, a pot. And so labeling those and then always date so that you remember when you planted them. The next thing, keep warm uh, between 65 and 80 degrees. You can use a plastic cover like you see in the picture here or glass. Um, it may not be necessary to do this. Um, a heating mat or heating cable can also go on the bottom to raise the temperature. Um, then you'll wait. You'll wait for your seeds to emerge or germinate. Once they have come up and they've germinated, uh, care for the seeds by watering daily from the bottom. Don't let them get too wet and don't let them dry out. Ensure adequate ventilation or airflow. Um, you'll move them to a location that is uh, 55 to 60 degrees at night and then during daytime, uh, 65 to 70 degrees. To minimize setback by transplanting before they outgrow their container um, or they're flat. Shortly after the first true leaves appear, uh, you will go ahead and plant into a larger pot. You'll carefully dig up and lift out, handle them by the leaves, not by the stem. This avoids tearing the roots, and if necessary, um, you can cut roots to cleanly disengage from the soil. You'll make holes approximately one to two inches apart and then transplant into their new pot and medium. You'll do the same depth as the seedling was growing in the flat. You do not want to bury the stem of your, your newly um, growing plant. Next, there are certain seeds that do best direct sown into your garden. And I really recommend checking with your local master gardener office to see if they have a vegetable planting guide, which indicates when to direct seed. But some examples that will go straight out into your garden beds might be zinnias, beans, peas, carrots, squash, cucumber, melons, and potatoes. Next slide, please. Your seed package is not just a, a beautiful package that it comes in. It has a lot of really important information. Things that you wanna look at. 
Uh, is the seed heirloom hybrid? What is its disease resistant? Uh, what's the plant spacing, the depths you need to plant it, um, the days to germination, days to harvest, its growing habit? Um, is it a pole bean or a bush bean? Is it a determinant or indeterminate tomato? Um, if you're not sure which seed packet to pick up, uh, master gardeners have great information on varieties. Uh, many master gardeners also have classes. So for example, in El Dorado County, there's a seed to table class on March 25th that the master gardeners are doing um, where they will be teaching what seeds to select, favorite varieties that grow well in our county, and then all the way to the master food preservers teaching about harvesting, um, making those wonderful sauces and what to do when you have too many tomatoes. Uh, can't make it to El Dorado County? You need to visit your local master gardener office. Next slide, please. Uh, so in every county in California, most counties, um, there is a master gardener office that are there to help the public. Our mission is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture and landscape to the communities in California. And we offer free classes, workshops, we have planting guides that are specifically produced by the master gardeners in your county. Um, help desks where you can bring questions that you might have, pictures, um, even samples that you can bring in and the master gardeners will research it and using University of California tools, get back to you with um, answers. Um, they have other resources like um, how to's and articles on a variety of different topics. We offer speakers that go out in the community and um, talk to garden clubs and community groups. Uh, we have demonstration gardens where folks can come and learn what they wanna plant in their um, gardens and, and home landscapes. We do school garden education. We write articles for publication. Um, we produce videos um, and we do just a lot of different classes online. Uh, we also have research partnerships and offer a volunteer training so that folks in the community that want to become master gardeners and disseminate um, research-based science on home horticulture can learn and then extend that information out to the public. Uh, we also have plant sales where um, folks can come and buy some wonderful plants. The great thing about the master gardener program is that we're in your communities and the QR code that's over um, on the right will show you um, directly to a link where you can find your master gardener program in your specific county. Next slide. So in closing, I just wanna say thank you so much for um, learning with us today on how to start seeds. And um, we look forward to hearing about your successes and um, we're here to answer questions and I'll put some links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy and Lauren for that great information.